You've got to set it free. Are you ready to set it free? Say it with me. I'm ready to set it free. Ready to set but it free. what? What are you setting free? What is this? What are we talking about? Today's text is all about this wonderful spirit of liberation and realization within our hearts and our lives. The ability to set free something very powerful within our lives. And I'm talking about your divine splendor. That's right. Your divine splendor. That which is deep within us, that we're releasing it, we're letting it go. How important it is for that which we release is to allow, to liberate, to set free your divine splendor. For too long it has been held captive. A prisoner. Quite often in our world today we have not really realized the depth of the divine splendor, the goodness within us. And what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about our potentiality. That's right. Divine splendor is speaking of possibilities, your potentiality, that which is available to you to be expressed and to be lived out. What you're saying, Pastor, I've got potential? That's right. Here at City of Light, we believe in the potentiality of everyone. For we believe in the foundation of Scripture that's been teaching this all along. That the very teaching of Jesus and the very essence of it is that there is a potential, a possibility within each every one of us yet to be fulfilled even higher, higher and higher. We sang it this morning. We're moving up to higher ground. And I love that last one. See you all in higher ground. Where we're going all up to a higher level of understanding. We are awakening in new ways to our potentiality, to the world of possibilities, to that wonderful divine splendor that we've held back for far too long. You may say, well, where is this splendor? I don't see it. What are you talking about, splendor? Where's this divine splendor that you speak of? Well, did you not hear the scripture? You proclaim so beautifully as we read it aloud. It says, Christ in you, your hope of glory. Christ in you, in you, in you, your hope, your belief, your trust, your unfolding of the wonderful glory of your, of your life, the goodness, the potential, the possibilities. You might say that when we acknowledge the Christ in us, what we're acknowledging is that there is infinite potentiality yet to unfold, yet to form within our lives and to be manifested, to be demonstrated and to be revealed. When we look at this passage, quite often the real essence of it has been lost. We've been looking at it for years, maybe through eyes that have been clouded over, through a lens that is dirty and dusty, because we've been misled sometimes by interpretations of this. When it says Christ in you, many people just assume it means Jesus in you. Jesus in you is your hope of glory. And that's where we misunderstand this divine possibility and everything that the Apostle Paul is writing about and suggesting for our lives. You see, Christ refers to, is not Jesus at all, but what Jesus discovered. Jesus discovered the dimension of Christ. The dimension of Christ. Now, that's a big one. We've been discussing this in our classes. A lot of people, wait a minute, Christ and Jesus, how do we separate those two? What do we understand? Because in Jesus' discovery, he discovered this and then figuratively became referred to as Jesus the Christ, or Jesus, a Christ. But quite often, then we just assume Christ again, as we say over and over again, is Jesus' last name Jesus Christ? No, it's not. We know what it is, is this wonderful awakening to our divine possibility, for the Christ is the God possibility within each and every one of us. So awaken to the divine possibility, the God possibility within you. This is your hope of glory. This is your hope of achieving your highest and best. When we awaken to this wonderful understanding, the Christ within Jesus was a wonderful discovery he too made. For as we look in the passages of Scripture in the chapter 2 of the book of Luke, verse 52, it describes Jesus. The boy grew and become, became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and with grace. His unmerited favor was upon him. Not deserved, but given to him freely. Not, shall we say, earned, shall we say. Not something that he had to, but was given, bestowed. And so it is that we find grace is bestowed for us, too. And at age 12, he's found in the temple. 
I love this story as we think about the family of Jesus coming together, brothers and sisters. There must have been a large crowd and a quite an activity at the time. They came to the temple, and when they all left, they're walking on way home. On their way home, they're looking, well, where's Jesus? Someone see Jesus? I haven't seen what? Did you, Jesus with you? I thought he was with you. Where is he? You can imagine as this little caravan of this family is moving to go back home, the stress of saying, wait a minute, we just lost one of our kids. Where do we leave him? Oh, I think we last saw him at the temple. And when they returned back to the temple, there they found him that he was sitting in the midst of teachers, listening to them and asking questions. He was already a seeker of wisdom as a young man, seeking, searching, inquiring, listening to the wonderful teaching opportunities provided within the temple. Quite often we kind of get a little confused about what church was meant to be. In Jesus' day, it was a learning experience. He was, well, I don't come to church to learn. I didn't come to church at all to learn. We got to go through some rituals. We need to bow so many times. We need to stand up. We need to shake a tambourine. We need to genuflect. We need to crisscross. We need to do all these kind of things. That's what I came to do. I came here to take a wafer and some juice, and that's what I came to do. And all those things are so important. And then, wait, 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 wait. But the ancient inception of gathering together was a time of learning. Understand, it was like class. Church was meant to be a time of spiritual enlightenment and education, a time of asking questions and searching, a time of sharing great truth. Here at City of Light, following the sermon today, we're going to pass the mic around and ask you to share a little bit. Those who are wanting to say, this is what I received, this is what I heard, because it's that teaching and learning experience that we want to engage in that was founded in the very beginning or the times of Jesus. So we find here that as he returned with his parents, again it says, now he's back home, and he grew in stature and wisdom. At around age 30, he has this baptism experience. We've talked about this over the years of this wonderful baptism experience of Jesus. Coming down to the rivers and sedge, as the tradition was for those waters to wash away in a cleansing experience. Those moving waters to carry away all kinds of things are such a beautiful metaphor of our own lives. For every day we invite this baptism experience, we're immersed in a water of new thought, a cleansing of new thought, of awakening every day to a fresh new approach. This week I posted on Facebook <clears throat> that says, every day has to be based on new experiences, not based on yesterday's experiences. You cannot put new wine into old wineskins. You cannot say today is based on everything and all the hardships and challenges of yesterday. And if it didn't work for me yesterday, it won't work for me today. And if I had problems yesterday, I'm probably going to have problems today. But no, oh, you're invited to put the fresh new day into a new context, into a new thought, putting fresh new wine into new wineskins. Or if you don't, what happens is putting new wine in old wineskins, those wineskins burst and are destroyed and the wine is lost. So it's important for we understand, as in Jesus' experience of baptism, it's the washing away with new thought, of the cleansing with new thought. Every day is a day of new beginnings, of a new fresh approach of the possibilities that are available to you. New thought, wow, what's my potential today? What could unfold for me today? What is the Christ, the God possibility within me, going to manifest today? Can you imagine waking up and setting that thought as your foremost thought as a baptism experience that cleanses and washes you, washes away and removes everything else, the tears of the past, of yesterdays, or of the night, and just awaken and say, wow, today is my day of great possibility. So what happens is that as he was in this baptism experience, one of the things that we often overlook is this beautiful phrase found within the New Testament. This says, as Jesus was praying, now, we're thinking, wait a minute, I thought he was baptized. You know, kind of wet, dipped in the water, maybe dunked a little bit. I don't know what they might have done back in those days. Held out until the preacher fills him back up. When you promise to tithe, we let you up. That's usually baptism experience. But uh, is it one of those kind of things? No, it was Jesus in prayer. It says, as he prayed, a dove descended. It felt like a dove descended. A metaphor of a dove descending. What is the dove all about? 
The dove is this wonderful metaphor of great peace. You can imagine the struggle that Jesus may have gone through in his life. Who am I? How do I fit in this world? Especially if we proclaim any kind of literalism to the story of Jesus being born into a family who Joseph is not his father. Can you imagine that kind of rumored culture in society of saying, who am I and how do I fit in this world? Are these my brothers? Are these my sisters in my family? Where do I fit? How do I and who am I? And as I study, how do I learn to share this goodness and experience my own God potential? Well, in this time of prayer, Jesus has this moment of discovery. This peace prevails over him. The dove, a symbol of great peace. Now, where else have we seen this dove? Oh, how many remember Noah and the ark? You remember Noah wondering whether it's time to step out of the ark, to come out of the ark? What does he do? He releases the dove. And the dove goes out and finds a twig uh, and brings it back saying, now is your moment. Step on out of the ark. Come on. Open up those doors. You're on dry land. Now is your time to move on out with all that you possess. Now is the day of your possibilities. Now is the day of your potentiality to be fulfilled. Now is the day of the whole promise of God to unfold through you. You see, the dove is a wonderful metaphor and a beautiful symbol. And I love how as we look at scripture, we look at symbols, we look at words, we look at uh, expressions, we look at phrases. Where else have they been repeated to help us echo and uh, see the definitions and the metaphors, meanings, or the symbolism within scripture? Just as the dove was released to bring back a message of peace all is well, the dove descends on Jesus not literally, but in the context of a peace, saying all is well. And Jesus discovers his potential in prayer. Let me tell you this. You wonder about your potential, your God possibility. What's really available for you and through you and in you and around you? It'll be found in prayer. For in prayer, that communion with God, in those moments that you spend in a wonderful sense of being in this presence, all things will be revealed for you. Your prayer time then becomes this expression of your faith and belief and trust as you speak affirmatively. I know that God is leading and guiding my footsteps. And I know that this uh, wonderful time of communion will shed new light on my pathway. That prayer becomes like a flashlight in your world of darkness where you feel like, I don't know where to go next. I don't know where to turn next. I don't know what to do next. I don't even know what potentiality. I don't even know about today, where to move or how to live in this moment. But in prayer, it becomes like a flashlight, boom, illuminating your pathway before you. And you know where to walk. You know where to step. You know how to move because you've been in communion with God. And God is there to speak to ever. Uh, reveal the very potentiality and possibilities for you in your life. And so it is that we have these great discoveries. As Jesus in this baptism moment awakens this great discovery, you too can have that great moment. People say, well, wait a minute. Do I need to be baptized to have this? Uh, you can be in prayer at any time. And baptism can be this wonderful release and let go that shedding and a wonderful way of saying through this ritual through, and it's not about the amount of water, it's not about dunking this or that, it's about an awareness and awakening to say, I welcome a cleansing water of new thought washing over me, awakening me to my potentiality and to help me to discover this wonderful truth. What did the voice that he felt within him speak? It says, you are my son, you are my, my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. You're my son. You're the heir. You're the one who is firstborn. You are the one who is the one who is uh, uh, in line to receive all that the father has is the firstborn son. And so we understand this spiritual truth that really speaks to us of this power of the divine working in us and through us and around us and for us and unfolding. For we are in relationship with God as children of God. It's great to wake up to that to discover this, because the beginning of releasing this wonderful blessing within your life of potentiality and possibility is knowing who you are, that you're the son. Now, 
probably one of the most important passages of Scripture in your Bible that you need to highlight, that you need to celebrate, maybe even put up on your refrigerator, write out, put on your dashboard, put out somewhere that you would see on a day-to-day -day basis, put it on a nightstand, you see it at the close of your day or the early morning when you wake up, is this beautiful passage from Genesis. God created man in his own image and after his likeness. We can't get that enough. But wait a minute. A lot of times that's overlooked. That's not the greatest scripture. Aren't there other scriptures that are far more important? Such as God is love. Or what about, how about, you know, all things are possible. What about all these other wonderful passages of scripture that preachers have been expounding for years? What makes this one so great? Why is this one important? Because it's the foundation of everything for our lives. It's us discovering our potentiality. It's us discovering Christ in us, born with Christ in us, created with God potentially in us, already there, already present within you. For God created man in his own image and after his likeness, and that image is as God sees you. That's right. That's the image. God sees you as loving. God sees you as kind. God sees you as perfect. God sees you as whole. God sees you as well. God sees you as prosperous. God sees you as blessed. God sees you as enlightened. Wow. God really sees us as something special. You see, that's the image that we're created in. And we must then reveal this likeness to the world. This is our calling. We must reveal it in our consciousness, in our thinking, in our outlook and life, and reveal it in our actions and everything we say and that what we do. In other words, within you is the unborn possibility of a limitless life. In you is the uh, unborn possibility of a limitless life. And your calling is to give it's there. Amazing potential. Goodness, grace, love. Incredible compassion. Wonderful passion for the things of the highest and best. And Wow, all that's there is yours. Did you know that it's already there within you? All we need to do is tap into it. It's already there. You've been created in the image and likeness. And when we understand that, we understand everything. Because underneath that concept and that truth, created in the image and likeness of God, as we understand, well, that's God's love. God's love. God is love because he loves us. He created us in his image. Not in some other image. Not in some other likeness. But loving us so much. And when we understand this, then the passage that we think is so great as all things are possible, well, we understand it because we're created in God's likeness and God's image. That's how all things are possible. So when we embrace this powerful passage, one of the most majestic statements in the Bible, when we hold it to be that which we understand on a day-to-day -day basis, and we wake up in the morning, I am the image of God, created in the likeness, and I'm ready to birth all the unborn possibilities that haven't yet been birthed yet. But today is a day. It's Labor Day. That's right. I am in labor, and I am releasing uh-huh, it's a newfound Labor Day, and I am birthing all kinds of possibilities today. And I am releasing and letting go, and I am bringing to the world these great possibilities. Because you are a potential Christ. That word Christ, that name Christ, was not for you, for Jesus alone, but for anyone who awakens to their God possibility within them. You are a potential Christ. And how cru crucial that is to uh, embrace that because when we understand ourselves fully and we really embrace this, we accomplish one of the great spiritual journeys of our life. Know thyself. Know thyself. Now, the ancients would put that phrase above the entrance to the temples. It's found within Greek temples. It's found in Delphi. It's found in many great ancient teachings, and Socrates also spoke of it. It's been passed down through the ages and alluded to throughout the scriptures all along. That phrase and that understanding, the journey of 
Do you know who you are? Know yourself. Know who you are. Know that you're created in the image and likeness of God and you are the God possibility in this world right now. You are the one who has the potential to birth unlimited and amazing divine manifestations. But you've got to know yourself. And until you really know that, you're just kind of walking around the world, not really paying a lot of attention, not really being an observer. How many of you saw the new sign out front? How many raised your hand and said, I didn't even see it, I drove by it? Mm -hmm. Some people have, see? How many of you saw uh, the, the flowers at the front door? Uh huh. Okay, some of you saw them, some of you didn't. Uh, you know, how many knew that the, the front door pole has been painted, that entrance area, and all the chipping paint has been uh, puttied and cleaned up and freshened up? You know, a lot of things in our life we walk by and we don't even notice. We don't pay any attention. One of my neighbors says, did you put a sidewalk in your house? I said, we put a sidewalk up probably about six months ago. Really? I guess I didn't notice. But you see, that's the world that we live in, isn't it? Uh, we live in a world where we're not always conscious and not always aware. And one of our problems is we're not truly conscious, aware of ourselves and who we are. Know thyself is so important. It's one's entire journey is that of self-discovery. And what happens when we really know ourselves is something wonderful. Proverbs 4, 23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance. Really know yourself. Know your heart. Know what's in you. Know who you are. Keep it with such vigilance from if it flows the spring of life. You know, there's a great hymn of the church, and we sang some beautiful hymns today. There's some great hymns of the church. One that you sing that really describes your spiritual journey. Getting to know me. Getting to know all about me. Getting to know me. Getting to feel free and easy. You see this wonderful song from Broadway Musical says it's really inapplicable that we put to ourselves. Getting to feel free and easy and when I'm with me, getting to know what to say. Haven't you noticed? Suddenly I'm bright and breezy because all of the beautiful and new things that I've learned about me day by day. Wow, we could turn that Broadway Musical into a great hymn of the church. It's your hymn. It's your song. Getting to know you. Getting to know me. Getting to understand, because when we do, that's so true, that suddenly I'm bright and breezy because of all the new and beautiful things I've learned about myself and I begin to understand and, and comprehend. I am a divine creation created with infinite possibilities. There's no limit, no limit. Somebody tell you there's limits in your life, things you can't do. I think we all can say somewhere along the line, someone told us there's a limitation. You'll only go so far. You're only going to achieve so much. My parents, with all of their uh, love for me as their child, never really thought much about education and said, you know, well, you're going to go to school. Well, lucky you, if you think you can find a school, you know, they never said, are you going to go to Yale, Harvard? What about, you know, are you going to some fabulous school and get your education? They said, schooling, honey, you're just lucky if you graduate from high school. Kind of was their mentality because neither of them they graduated past the eighth grade. So when you think about possibilities, it was kind of difficult to think, wait a minute, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go on to seminary. I'm going to move beyond just college to postgraduate. I'm going to get a doctorate. Well, they were like, who are you and all your getting full of yourself now all of a sudden? No, this is my divine potential that there's no limits of what are possible within our hearts and our lives. Our destiny is then to produce this likeness of God, limitness of God, possibilities and potentiality of God from within. Here's how we understand this divine image. Sort of a loose interpretation can be the I am image. Image. I am image. Okay? You see that? I am image. Image. You're born in the I image, the image of God, created in the image of God, the I am within you. And what is the I am? Oh, you remember the story of Moses out in the wilderness, confronted by the burning bush, feeling the challenge and the call then to go and set his people free to return back to the Pharaoh's palaces. 
to go to Egypt and to speak on behalf of the Hebrew people to set them free from their bondage. And Moses said, but who do I say sent me? And the voice was, the I am that I am. The I am is God within you. The I am-age is the image, the very likeness of the divine within our hearts and our lives. The I am is God, but I am is God experienced within man. God experienced in you. God revealed in you. The I am is there within you, but it needs to be revealed, manifested, spoken, revealed, demonstrated. So when we acknowledge the I am image, the image of God, we begin to understand our divine possibilities. Now, theologians have said that Jesus was God become man. But Jesus knew already that uh, God had already become man when he breathed the breath of life into his own image and became the living soul. God had already become man when he gave breath to you for the essence of God was in you. So God was saying, I became a living being. The very essence of breath in you is the divine soul. It is God in you. That breath that sustains you, that life that you live in this world is already there. It is there in each and every day. But unfortunately, in our world today, we find in our tradition, cult, tradition cultures that we find this teaching that says, well, you're a sinner, and Jesus was the divine. You're a sinner, and Jesus was the divine. And so, honestly, then what happens is we totally miss and we lose out completely on the very essence of the teaching of Jesus. Now, why is it? We talked about this in our classes this week, but quite often the world wants to say you're a sinner. Lots of S's because it really has to have that hissing sound to make it sound even worse. You're a sinner when Jesus says you're the light of the world. But the church says, no, you're a sinner. No, I'm the light of the world, Jesus. Says, oh, no, I'm sorry, you're a sinner. You have sinned, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. You're really a sinner. You're really bad. You're evil. You're there. Are you unworthy? That's your name, sinner. But Jesus said, I didn't call you sinner. I called you light, the light of the world, the wisdom, the understanding, the understanding of all the possibilities within your life. How did the church get it so wrong? How did we miss out on this? Oh, you see, it's much easier to control a community when I tell you, you all are sinners and you're going to burn and you are going to die and suffer. Oh, yes. And if you tithe or you give or you come to church or you do X, Y, and Z, or if you sing, dance, or shuffle cards or whatever it may be that the church may require of you, hmm, you may make it into heaven. We'll see. You see, it's so much easier from that perspective to constantly speak, constantly of fear that you are a sinner and you're Lucky, you're going to be saved by grace. Just lucky. You're going to get in by the skin of your teeth. Instead of understanding, you're the light. Divine potential is within you. Your goodness is there. It's time for you to acknowledge it, but no one understands that the importance of first and foremost, knowing who they are, knowing themselves and how important that is. It's almost as if Christian, Christ, traditional Christianity wants us to think differently. Almost as if their song is that Irving Berlin song from the Broadway show. Two, number two, hang on. Everything he can do, I can do better. Everything he can do, I can do greater. No, you can't. Yes, you can't. No, you can't. Yes, you can't. You know, the church is saying, no, you can't. Oh, wait a minute. Scripture says, everything Jesus does, I can do better. I can do greater. Why? Because Jesus told me I could, right? No, you can't. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. No, you can't. You see how this, this dialogue goes on and on and on as if we're in a Broadway musical all of a sudden? But it's Annie, get your gun. And well, sometimes it's the church. Get a weapon and tell everybody you can't. You can't do it because only God can. And we don't really want to tell you that you're created in God's image and likeness. And there's divine potentiality and possibility within you and that you actually can. Because here it is. Jesus went on and said, there are things that I do that you can do too. And greater things shall you do if you have the faith. Wait a minute. Greater than Jesus? Yes. Jesus expected, anticipated, believed, hoped for, trusted, and taught that greater things than he did, you would do too. That's the great expectation. 
Now, you know, every teacher wants to see their students excel well beyond themselves. Teachers don't say, I hope you are just don't make it out of third grade because I'm the third grade teacher and I know more about third grade education than you do. And I hope you don't make it to fourth grade because I'd love to have you in third grade because I'm the only one in third grade and I'm the third grade teacher and I'm all in. But that's not what a teacher says. A teacher says, I want you to learn everything in third grade. So you go to fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. You'll graduate, go on to college. I hope you excel well beyond that which I give you. I hope that you are greater than I am. That's the aspiration of a great teacher. And Jesus' hope and belief is that what I teach you, what I give you, what I show you, what I impart to you, I want you to take it and do more than I did. Okay? Instead of feeding 5,000, how about we see 6,000? Instead of breaking loaves and fishes, how about we break pizza and Coke? I mean, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to share? How are we going to do this greater? Here's again, divine potentiality is ours to think in new and different ways. What all kinds of things could we do? Well, the potential is there. For Christ in you is this hope of a divine revelation of all this potentiality within you. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect? Now, why would he say this? Really? Be ye perfect? Wait a minute. Who's perfect here? We're not perfect. Yet Jesus is inviting us to say, be ye perfect. He did not believe that, if he did believe that everyone contained within him the same unborn possibility of perfection, he wouldn't say that, would he? He would say, honey, I'm going to tell you, there's no hope for you. You ain't going to ever be perfect, so don't even try. But what does he say? Be ye perfect. Awaken. Awaken to your divine potentiality. Awaken to the possibilities. Be perfect as God is perfect. Whoa. Really? You see Jesus seeing the divine potential in us? That's why he spoke that way. That's why he taught that way. Because he saw it already within us and he's inviting us. Now, give birth to this wonderful idea. But there's perfection in you. There's perfection in you. I see it in you. Just as God is perfect, I see it in you too. So let's be more specific. It's not just perfection someday, like when we die, or perfection maybe when we're older and more mature, and we've given up sowing our wild oats, and we've given up our wild ways, and we're too old to party anyway, so we might as well just try to be perfect. What else have we got to live for? It's not that. You're perfect now. You're perfect right now. The potential there is for you to live out perfection. But you have to realize that's how you were made. You're already created in the image and likeness. Perfect. So a lot of times, well, we, all I know is to focus on my flaws because that's all anyone else has ever done. They've always said, you're too this or not enough of that. You're never going to make it. You're too short. You're too fat. You're too tall. You're too skinny. You're too this. You're too that. And you don't have enough of X or enough of Y. So, you know, be mediocre. You know, try your best. Do whatever you can. Because, honey, you know, it ain't going to work out anyway. And we kind of lived in that kind of world where we don't realize and awaken to the wonderful sense that it's right here and now that we have this potential to be perfect. Now, there's a beautiful passage that is written in a secular book written by Thoreau, and he says, the, calls it the license of a higher order of being. The license of a higher order of being is given to you. What he's illustrating is that you already got the license. You already got the license to be. How many of you remember when you were 15, 16, getting your driver's license, so excited? I now I'm going to have permission I'm now I'm going to have a permit. I'm going to have a license that allows me to get behind the wheel and spin around and do those wheelies and, and burn rubber and cruise town and turn the radio up on, and cruise down. You know, we're looking so cool driving down. The, you were looking forward to that, right? You were hoping that you got your license because your license opened all kinds of doors. And the license to be great, to be perfect, to experience your divine potential, 
you've already got. It. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to apply for it. You don't have to test for it. You don't have to go through uh, some sort of education process to receive it. It's always there. It's always been. God has already done for us all that, that God wants to do when he included us and created us in the image and likeness. I did everything for you. What else do you need? You are me. You are the image of me. You are the likeness of me. What more do you want? You don't need anything more. You've got license to go out and live it because that's how I created you. Wow. Pretty amazing, isn't it? God doesn't need to do another thing for us. Because God did it all already in the creation experience, created in the likeness and the image. Wow. Could we write that on our board? Could we write that across our entrance to our home? Could we write that on our refrigerator? Could we write that on the mirror? Take your lipstick, guys, and write it out. Put it out there. You know, just say, I believe in the greatness. I am created in the image and likeness of God. Because this is what it's all about. That potential is already built in you. How many of you saw our new sign up front once again? That new sign that we've been waiting for? We're so proud of it. It just proclaims City of Life. Here's the unique thing about that sign. Previously, the letters were up there declaring this location. 85 Park Ridge North was what it used to be years ago as a secular facility. And there was a floodlight on the ground shining up at those words, trying to illuminate so that those who passed by would know 85 North Park Ridge Road. Oh, okay. Park Ridge was the name of these different complexes over there. It's called Park Ridge South. This was Park Ridge North. So this light was shining on it, trying to reveal the words, the, the message, the address, who we are. Ah. But we have a new sign. And the new sign is lit from within. And this light shines out. Versus a floodlight trying to illuminate from without. Trying to say this is what you are. And let me shine some light. And try to reveal what this location is. Oh, it's a beautiful metaphor of what we teach and what we preach. And how we believe here at City of Light. It's within you. Already built within you. When the sign was put up, it was built in that the LED lights were already inside and those bright orange letters that say City of Light, bam, they pop at night. They're illuminated. That flame logo that speaks of the light of the world that we are is illuminated at night. It shines from within out, not from without trying to light up within. Your built-in potentiality is there. Created in this wonderful image in God, this likeness of God, it is the Christ in you that is your hope of glory. So Paul challenges us as he writes in the New Testament to stir up the gift of God within you. Stir up this wonderful thing. That's it. Turn it up. Come on. Get down there. Stir the pot. Get your spoon into the uh, mix of your life. And stir it up and go all the way to the bottom. You know how it is how important we stir things? My mother would always say, honey, when you stir, you got to get all the way down to the bottom, right? you got to get all that good stuff that's sunk to the bottom of the pan and stir it up and get it to come up to the surface. Mix it all up really good. Well, that's how it is. Deep down within us, we've got to stir it up to bring it up in our awareness and our consciousness. Today is the day to set it free. Today is the day that you've got to say, say it with me. I am setting it free. I am setting it free. I am setting And what is your setting free? Your divine splendor. The knowing, the understanding. This is who I am. I live in the I am image, the image of God. Amen.